Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Thursday Bible Life today. It's June 23rd, 2022, and we find ourselves in the Gospel of John, chapter number 9. If you'll get your Bibles and turn there, if you'd like to read along with me, we're going to look at this particular chapter. It's a fairly long chapter, but it goes pretty quickly. There's some interesting things here, and this is one of those favorite stories in the life and ministry of Jesus that I like. It's about him healing a man who was blind. In fact, he had been born blind. We're not told how old he was, but we get the idea from the things that he says that he's uh, beyond 20 years of age, maybe even considerably older than that. And he has some understanding spiritually. And uh, so we'll work ourselves through this chapter number nine of the Gospel of John and see what we can understand from it and make application to us at the end of it. Remember that we're in about the last seven or eight months of Jesus' earthly ministry and life. He has been in the Jerusalem area for the Feast of Tabernacles. And in the past few weeks, we have, from the Gospel of John, looked at a couple of the I Am statements that John records in his Gospel. He records seven of them in particular. In chapter 6, we read where Jesus said that I am the bread of life. In chapter number 8, we read that during that Feast of Tabernacles, especially during the evening time when they would have ceremonies that involved lighting candles and torches, that Jesus made the statement, I am the light of the world. And then at the end of our time last week, he made the statement to those unbelieving Pharisees and religious leaders concerning the uh, discussion they had about who is their father and who is his father. And they mentioned Abraham was their father. And Jesus said that uh, if they were of their father Abraham, they would not be trying to kill him like they were. And then he went on to say, before Abraham was, I am. Well, that brings us to chapter 9 and verse number 1 of the Gospel of John. And I'll begin reading in verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Here is a situation where his disciples are kind of in the same trap that the so-called three friends of Job were in. The three friends of Job listened to him and had compassion on him and sat with him for seven days without speaking. Probably were a great a blessing to Job at that time. But when they began to speak, the words that they had to say basically brought out the idea that their belief was that Job must be hiding some great sin that had resulted in him suffering the way he did, losing his family and all of his possessions and even his health. But when we read through the book of Job, especially after we read the first chapter, we understand that the purpose of all of that was to bring honor and glory to God and to show to the people and especially to Satan that it's possible for a man to worship and love God even if he has nothing. And Job did that. So when we come to this particular story, immediately when they pass by this man who had been born blind, was blind all of his life and sat there as a beggar, the disciples' inquiry to Jesus was, is this man blind because of his sin or because of his parents? And Jesus answered in verse number three, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. 
Sometimes we don't understand the things that we endure or the difficulties that come along in life. I'm convinced based upon what I read in the Bible and the witness and testimony I've seen in the lives of many people that God sometimes allows some of his choice servants and children to suffer hardships, to use them as a witness and a testimony of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and God Almighty, to a witness as a witness to the world. And one of these days, uh, those people, and maybe you and I, uh, will find out for, ex for sure why God allowed for things to happen than our lives that we may have questioned. So Jesus said that neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Then he said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So here he says he's the light of the world again. And he made this comment, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And he who sent me wanted me to work while it was day. The night is coming when no one can work. An underlying theme of this chapter will be the difference between night and day, between light and darkness. And so we'll bring that point home a little bit more as we get through the uh, particular end of the chapter. Verse number six. When he said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. So he went and washed and came back, seeing. Therefore the neighbors of those who previously had seen that he was blind and was a beggar said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, Well, it's certainly like him. He said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. So here's the whole scenario of the miracle that Jesus performed in healing this man who had been born blind. And the remainder of the chapter will be how we see that people perceive what had happened and question the actions that had taken place and then have another confrontation with the Lord. In verse number 13, from verse 13 to verse 34, we're going to see that the Pharisees will interrogate this man and will then, at the end of their interrogation, in their frustration, excommunicate him from the synagogue. Verse 13, they brought him who was formerly blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. We could almost anticipate that coming, couldn't we? It seems like so many of the miracles that we read about in the Gospels, Jesus performed on the Sabbath day. And I know that Jesus was without sin, and so he wouldn't have sinned in trying to irritate people on purpose, but it's almost as if he saved some of his biggest miracles, or at least the ones that we read about, to have happened on the Sabbath day just to frustrate those religious leaders. But I, I probably have the wrong idea about that. Verse 15, Then the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and now I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. So here's this uh, blindness that we begin to see come out in the Pharisees. There's been a tremendous miracle happen, and they can't dwell on that at the moment for being antagonistic and irritated towards this man Jesus and paying attention to the fact that whatever has happened, this man brought it about on the Sabbath when there's not supposed to be this kind of activity. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. 
Then they said to the blind man again, What do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him. Remember when it says the Jews in situations like this, it means the unbelieving religious leaders. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents, and this is an interesting response by his parents. His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age. Ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews, these unbelieving religious leaders, had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was the Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So whatever of the age was, which many Bible scholars believe would have been 20 years of age in the land of Israel among the Jewish nation, because that was the age at which uh, they were uh, drafted into the military or were made available to become soldiers, it would be similar to in our country being 21. Well, they said, he's of age, ask him. So these parents didn't want to get uh, thrown out of the synagogue. So they're going to put all the responsibility and the answers on their son. Kind of a interesting attitude they had. Verse 24. So they called the man again who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, And from this point, for a few verses, it's going to end up looking like to me that this man who had been healed ends up schooling the Pharisees, and they're not going to like that. Then he said to them again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. When we finally get over into the uh, epistles of the New Testament in our journey from Genesis to eternity, and we finally make our way to the book of Hebrews, we'll find that the writer of Hebrews points out the superiority of Jesus to a whole lot of things and a whole lot of people. He will be superior to angels. He will be superior to Moses, superior to Abraham. And so here, these people are saying, we're Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Why, this is a marvelous thing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So this healed man who now has his sight is basically schooling these Pharisees, these unbelieving Jews, and they don't like it. So in verse number 34, they answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins and you are teaching us. And they cast him out. So they put him out of the synagogue. In our day, they would say he got churched. <laughs> so quite an amazing uh, confrontation there between the unbelieving Jews, the Pharisees, and this man who had been born blind, and Jesus had healed him. So now we find in verse 35 through the rest of the chapter that Jesus is going to give the spiritual lesson in all of this concerning this physical healing. He's going to talk about true vision and true blindness. And it's another example how Jesus is going to come to this man and give him some mentoring 
even though it's brief. And it would translate into our day when someone becomes a new believer in Christ, a new Christian, we shouldn't just let them hang on the vine or die on the vine, so to speak. We should help bring them along and mentor them. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out and when he found him, he said to him, do you believe in the son of God? He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him and it is he who is talking with you. In other words, Jesus said, I am he. And then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Several times we find in the New Testament during the ministry of Christ, when people would come before him, especially ones that he had healed or dealt with, oftentimes we will read that they fell down and worshiped him. Or here we read that I do believe and he worshiped him. And my question always is, what do you suppose that person did or what that person said that was considered to have been worshiping Christ? Interesting question. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see and that those who see may be made blind. This is verse 39 of John chapter 9 where it says, Jesus said, for judgment I have come into the world. Another way of considering this statement is because of judgment I have come into the world. I want to read a couple of verses concerning the thought about this. The first one comes from John's gospel also in verse or in chapter number 12. We'll be there in a few weeks. In verse 47, Jesus is speaking with his apostles. He said, if anyone hears my words and does not believe or does not keep my words, I do not judge him for I did not come to judge the world but to save the world. So when we read this verse 39 in John chapter nine, Jesus said, for judgment I've come into the world. I don't believe that he came to judge the world in his first coming. He will indeed judge the world when he comes back. But we can look at this and say, because of judgment, because of the lost condition of mankind, I have come into the world. The other verse I wanna read comes from the gospel of Luke chapter number 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So we come back to John chapter 9 and we read now verse number 40. We can see that there were some of these unbelieving Jews or Pharisees that had followed Jesus and was listening to his conversation with this man that he had healed. And in verse 40 they said, some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to them, are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. This is where Jesus is going to transition the thought from physical sight and physical healing to spiritual sight and to spiritual salvation. I want to read from Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23. This is a portion of the Sermon on the Mount, and I think it fits the situation that we're looking at here. In Matthew 6, 22 and 23, Jesus said, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, in other words, clear, or a healed eye, healthy eye, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad or is evil or unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So Jesus is saying to these unbelieving Pharisees that if you were blind, in other words, you admitted that you didn't see and understand, and then you heard my words and believed them, then your sin would be forgiven and you would have true vision, true spiritual sight. But he says, now that you say that you see, although you don't 
really see me as the son of God and you don't believe my words, then he says, your sin remains. Well, I want to read from the first chapter of John's gospel. John wrote what we have read this morning in chapter 9. John began his gospel. And I want to read these words at the first chapter of the gospel of John. We've read them before, and it also fits the situation today. And I want us to consider these first 13 verses of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So this underlying theme of light and darkness, night and day, life and death, belief and unbelief, is what we're considering and a transition from, from physical to spiritual. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, referring to John the Baptist. This man came as a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. I believe this passage would indicate that there's a certain amount of light or understanding that God gives to every human being that's born. And it relates to the idea that the Apostle Paul mentions in the first chapter of the book of Romans, that no one is without excuse. We all have enough understanding that there is a God, but there are people that do not want to follow that light that's given to them, and so they become the other direction. Verse 10 of John chapter 1 says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as did receive him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So one more passage I want to read to us this morning. And that comes from another writing of this Apostle John, but it comes from his little epistle of 1 John. And it will be the way he began, 1 John chapter 1. I want to read the first uh, few verses of it, and it fits our situation again this morning with Jesus being the light and John's bearing witness of him. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. In other words, Jesus. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, in other words, don't believe in him, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In this morning's passage that we read, a man who was born physically blind was healed by Jesus and was physically able to see. And then he asked about who the Lord was when Jesus asked him, did you believe in the Son of Man or the Son of God? And he said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe? And Jesus told him, basically, it is me. 
I am he. And then the man said, I do believe. And he worshiped him. So this man received not only physical sight, but spiritual sight. He was healed in his vision, not only physically, but spiritually. And we see this comparison of the physicality with the spiritual. And if a person spiritually sees the light in Jesus Christ and trusts in him as God's son and his savior and Lord, he will receive spiritual sight and also spiritual life. And that would be the takeaway for us today that one of our responsibilities as a Christ follower, as we read from what the Apostle Paul taught us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, we are to try to bring all men to be reconciled to God the Father by and through God the Son. We're to bear witness of Jesus, who is the light of the world. So one of my favorite stories, healing this man that was born blind from, he was blind from birth. Next week, we'll see uh, some more episodes and events and things in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus as he's progressing in his ministry in the last seven or eight months of it on his way to Calvary. And this particular time that we're looking at in the last couple of weeks and this week that we've been reading during the time of the Feast of Tabernacles would be during our time of September or October. And then the Feast of uh, Passover, which will be in the spring, which would fall in uh, late March or early April on our calendar, that's the time frame. So from the time of September until the following March or April is where we're at on the calendar in Jesus' earthly ministry. Father, thank you so much for loving us and for the blessings of your word and how that we can read it and our hearts be drawn close to you. Thank you for those who are joining us online. We ask for your blessings upon them. We just look forward so much to possibly the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for your mercy upon our country and our people, upon the people around the world who are in some places suffering from the terrible atrocities of war, other places where people are enduring heartaches and hardships of various reasons. And we just ask that it might be soon when the Lord comes and sets up his kingdom. We so look forward to that. Until then, help us to be faithful and to be witnesses of the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, the light of the world. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. Well, until Saturday evening's weekly recap of our chronological reading, or until we see you next week, Lord bless you.